Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are going back to a ton of Spider-Man video games. This is the week, ladies and gentlemen, Spider-Man 2 is finally here. And Spider-Man is no stranger to Retro Rebound. We've made over a dozen Spider-Man focused videos on this channel to celebrate releases like No Way Home or Across the Spider-Verse, but we've never had the chance to truly sit down and celebrate the release of a Spider-Man video game here on this channel. Retro Rebound didn't exist when we first got Spider-Man PS4 in 2018. One of my favorite games ever, easily one of my favorite Spider-Man games ever because of its approach to the duality of Spider-Man, its brilliant combat, there's so much to love about that game. The web swinging is zen-like and I could go on and on. So naturally I was really excited for Spider-Man 2 and to celebrate, I wanna take every Spider-Man game from 2000 and on and reflect because so much has happened between then and now and even looking at Spider-Man 2 I can see little sprinkles of inspiration from all of these different titles that have come out over the years. So let's go through them shall we? If you're new here and you're into nostalgic retrospective content or yes even Spider-Man videos we got much more on the way after this consider subscribing and let's begin with the one playing right behind me here a special one one that puts me right in my feels whenever I think about it Spider-Man 64. So every video game in your collection to me has a story, how you obtained it. Some are as simple as went to the store and bought it, nothing else to it. Some, there's a much more emotional tale connected to it. Spider-Man 64 is one of those rare examples for me. I remember I was getting ready to go to preschool, three years old, and Maddie was terrified for what reason, I don't know, but I was nervous, I was crying up a storm. I went like a little trooper, I had a good time, I came back home, first day was great. And I remember getting into the back seat and I'll just preface it with this. When I was a kid, I imagine many of you can relate, didn't have much money growing up, so any game you got was a, a mind-blowing experience because it's like, we, I got this new game, it's a new thing, I get to play with this forever and ever and ever, and you'd make that game last. So I get in the back seat and I see a bag from Toys R Us and my mom's looking at me smiling, she goes, go ahead, open it. And so I crack it open and what would you know is in there, but this copy right here, Spider-Man 64. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe it because this is where my love of Spider-Man was truly born. It was this video game. I didn't grow up with comic books. The first entry in the Raimi trilogy was yet to release. So this was my first introduction to Spider-Man as a whole. And the Spider-Verse in totality, when you looked at the secret costume unlocks, you could get Scarlet Spider-Man 2099. You could get the white Spider-Man costume. I was like, what is this? He goes beyond just being red and blue. What, what is this? This is incredible. So I always fondly remember this game just because of the way I got it and where my love of Spider-Man was born. But also what puts me in my feelings is hearing this initial introduction when the game first kicks off, voiced over by Stan Lee. Welcome, true believers and newcomers alike. Spider-Man co-creator Stan Lee here. Once again, we find our hero Peter Parker, better known around the world as the amazing Spider-Man in a heap of trouble. But this is just the beginning, Spidey fans. So get ready for a true superhero action thriller, packed to the brim with thrills and chills, twists and turns, more super villains than you can shake a web at, and of course, non-stop web slinging, wall crawling action. I feel like I'm reading the little blur before paging into an epic comic book story, and they capture that feel perfectly. If I could say anything I love about Spider-Man 64 and its PS1 counterpart, it's the creative decisions made that I think put it even in a positive area, critically speaking. You know, I could sit here all day and get nostalgic about a game, but rose tinted glasses as they say, right? But when I look at Spider-Man 64 objectively, I think it makes a lot of great decisions. Hey, we are on the N64 and PS1. We can't make a big open Spider-Man game like you see in the old cartoons where he can web swing around New York City, like in the comics. He can't do that with this current technology. How do we limit him narratively? And so you see a smog engulfing New York City and it's completely taken over. And if you go down there, it's like insect repellent. That's a dead spider. So you can't go down there and web swing. 
and that forced them to get creative. Okay, what are the levels gonna be? So now you get things like a bank robbery. You get crazy levels that may play out behind me, like where Spider-Man is fighting on top of a train against a bunch of the lizard's minions. You get some insane levels in here as they go through a rogues gallery in what feels like a volume of a comic book. It is awesome. But those limitations also bred more innovation. I think about the difference in cutscene delivery between the PS1 version, which was the traditional cutscene you'd expect nowadays, versus in Spider-Man 64, which was a comic book panel style delivery. And quite frankly, this may be more nostalgia talking, but I prefer the 64 version. I mean, holding the controller, I don't really prefer, but I definitely do prefer that cutscene style. I love when games are more artistically driven than chasing down fidelity. It's something we'll get into a bit when we talk about Ultimate Spider-Man in a little bit. Spider-Man 64 was also, for me at least, a downright terrifying video game. It was because of the voice performances, whether it was the way Venom was laughing as these enemies were dropping down on me on top of the train, to the horrifying performance from Carnage in one of the final levels of the game. <laughs> nice try! <laughs> like seriously, that stuff as a kid sent shivers down my spine. I was terrified of Carnage, but I was also just fascinated. I wanted more of him, and I asked and begged for more and more, and we finally got that wish in Amazing Spider-Man 2 as a video game, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But Spider-Man 64, this is a game I could go on all day about. It is a special one. I love missions like getting to the Daily Bugle before Scorpion beats the life out of J. Jonah Jameson. Stuff like that, man. I mean, you could tell how much I love Spider-Man. Look at the look at the, the action figure right here. Well, we're gonna talk about the Raimi Spider-Man movies in a little bit, but we still got one more game in this duology to talk about. Let's get into Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro. So, one year later, in 2001, we get this game here, Spider-Man 2 Enter Electro. Now, imagine being me in the year 2020, I'm talking to a buddy, and he goes, hey, have you ever played Enter Electro, you know, the Spider-Man sequel to 64? And I go, oh, hold on, pal. Sequel? There was a second one of this? Are you kidding me? Imagine being this age and learning that one of your favorite Spider-Man games has a sequel. You never heard of it, and you never played it. So, I was out of my seat in joy, thinking of the possibilities. This game, granted I've only played a little bit of it to be completely transparent because I do plan on doing a full-on deep dive of it down the stretch before the end of this year. This game has done quite a bit to put me back down in my seat, settle a little bit. For starters, there's a little bit less fun creative choices in Enter Electro that I think made Spider-Man 64 or Spider-Man 1, whatever you want to call it, more special. For example, there is a bit of excitement when I first noticed, oh, the smog is gone. So now when you're web swinging over New York City, you can see below, you can see down to the streets. This was technically impressive at its time, and granted, we've grown a bit more familiar with seeing the city up close and personal, starting off with Spider-Man 2. But putting my mind back to the time period, I understand that this was a pretty big deal. Not only that, but because the smog is all cleared up, guess what you can do? You can go down to street level now. So in my head, I'm thinking there's a lot of possibilities here for a Spider-Man game where I can have all the variety of the missions and levels that we saw in Spider-Man 1, but now, oh man, we can go to the streets. Like, what can we do to transition from level to level? But unfortunately, I think that it gets less creative, and this is why I always say, not to get all hoity-toity and on my soapbox here, but some teams from since the dawn of video games really when they get less limitations they get less innovative and so i always say that limitations breed innovation and i think spider-man 64 versus spider-man 2 is the perfect example of that enter electro is not a bad game by any stretch it's the same combat you get to go to a street level there's a new set of villains you fight sandman for example like you get a lot of cool new stuff here but I think you lose out on some of the creative levels because now you're cycling between warehouses, streets, and rooftops pretty consistently, at least throughout the opening stretch of the game. And it's not really just about the locales because I mean, let, let's keep it real, like every Spider-Man game is in New York City. So it's, it's not that, it's more like, oh, in the opening mission of Spider-Man 64, you take a big bomb and you throw it in the safe and you hear the quirky line, I should put this in a safe place. 
Love that type of stuff, right? Eat it up all day. But this game just right now doesn't have that kind of spirit. But it's awesome that it exists. It's crazy to have this in my collection and be like, oh yeah, I've only played this once. <laughs> When do, when do I ever get to say that about a 20-year-old Spider-Man game? So yeah, it, it's awesome that you can also create your own Spider-Man. I thought this was a really unique feature for the game where you can put on different tools and powers, which I think gives it a little bit something extra. I think this is where nostalgia, if I played this game when I was a kid, would have helped me out a lot because now we're taking the suits that I already saw and loved and you're adding powers to them. So there's a little bit more of kidding out before starting. So I appreciate Enter Electro a lot. I gotta spend more time with it before I really solidify how I feel about it, but it is no doubt an important game in the Spider-Man lineage because this is where you could actually hit the streets. Remember, with great power, great responsibility the Raimi trilogy so many fond memories this action figure I called it out earlier this is the era that I love in Spider-Man and in fact if you look on the inside of the enter electro case you'll see here that they're actually promoting this game back here this to me is one of the best ever Spider-Man games made and I know looking at it you may raise an eyebrow like Matt some of the missions are pretty janky this is very limited, whereas at least Enter Electro opened things up a bit more. And I hear you, I hear you, and I hear you. But look, to me, this is the beginning of traditions. Things like Bruce Campbell cameos, because he was a good friend of Sam Raimi's, and so he would show up in the game's tutorials and roast the life out of you. Welcome to the tutorial. Yeah, I know, you want to get on with things, beat up the bad guys, do the whole superhero thing blah 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 but given that it's the last of its kind that meant that spider-man 1 was more like a next gen version of spider-man 64 to me this rogues gallery level by level nature that i just happen to adore do i want in modern spider-man games well actually there's one good example in this pile we're going to get to that if they didn't like that again i would actually be kind of for it but some of the missions here just put me in my feels i think of the subway station mission, where you go into Grand Central Terminal, down to the subway stations, and eventually the sewers, where the cinematics are insane, where Spider-Man shoots out a web, and you see it forming in real time, and it attaches to the back of the van, all the way down to the camera zipping and zooming around to police fighting off different enemies, and even this triple camera shift shot that they did for the shocker blowing up a pillar, within Grand Central Terminal that's gonna kill like the one civilian in there. It's hilarious, it's goofy, it's weird, but as a kid, this was so cool, so larger than life. And when you look at Spider-Man 2 and 3, which are, at least on PS2, graphically unimpressive games, to put it generously, Spider-Man 1 looks really good to this day. Like the suit, the character model looks really, really good. And I get why when we went for more open Spider-Man, we saw a downgrade in graphics. I get all that, but oh man, this game still looks good to me. And I'm not gonna paint it as all perfect. There are missions in this game that I find awful. There's the mission where you infiltrate Oscorp, and this was like many Spider-Man games where they couldn't get the stealth camera right. So I remember as a kid hating this mission so much. Or the one I always go to with the Vulture's Tower. He's just chucking grenades down the stair set, just yawning. Here's another eight, Matt, have fun. Awful, okay? So there are missions in this game that are bad. But the reason why I think I have a soft spot for it is where it reminds me most of Spider-Man 64 is in its crazy unlock nature. So I mentioned fun spider suits that you could get in Spider-Man 64 and how mind-blowing that was. But now in Spider-Man 1 here on PS2, you'd get things like playing as the Green Goblin in Green Goblin mode. You get to wear a skin as the Shocker. And so it added this high replay value that connects to a game that I did a pretty significant deep dive here on the channel with 2003's TMNT, where at face value, oh, it's just a beat em up. But that is not only the spiritual successor in a 3D area to Turtles in Time, it's got a stupid amount of unlocks that made the game way, way bigger and deeper than you would ever, ever imagine. And Spider-Man 1, is much like that. From impressive cinematics, all the way to kind of fun, janky combat, I just adore this game. And also, if you're looking to pick it up, I know I have the PS2 version here, get the Xbox version. There's an exclusive Craven the Hunter mission that you won't want to miss out on because 
that's kind of the fun of these old movie tie-in games. While it's telling the story from the movie, they weave in the rogues gallery that try to keep it like, oh, this is worth picking up. See, it's not the same thing you just watched a couple of hours ago, no. So Spider-Man 1 is a special game to me, but to the games industry as a whole, Spider-Man 2, I think is far, far more special and transformative. I have nothing left except Spider-Man. This one is where the template was built. This is the foundation of which every single Spider-Man game afterwards would be built upon. Still to this day, there are side activities in this game that have yet to be not included in future Spider-Man games. It blows my mind in a sense that, oh wow, we still have this attachment to Spider-Man 2 all the way back to 2004, but at the same time, it blows my mind that we haven't figured out new things to put in the New York City beyond car chases. What hasn't been said about Spider-Man 2 that you've already heard before is the real question because everything I'm about to say you're gonna note is in probably a modern Spider-Man game. This was the beginning of the open world template. This was the beginning of the side missions like stopping a car chase. This is where the physics focused web swinging began. It was no longer about Hey, I'm just gonna throw these webs up into the cloud like it's been since Spider-Man 64. This game thought, what if we made these attached to nearby objects? And so you would see the web attached to buildings. That was crazy back then. And there were Spider-Man games that still in the modern age weren't doing that type of stuff as time went on. I think Web of Shadows is one of them where they just didn't care to do that. But Spider-Man 2 did. Spider-Man 2 is where air tricks were introduced in the video game space, where you would keep hitting the jump button, you'd gain XP points as you did all manner of flips. Spider-Man 2 is where you had progression with points that would unlock moves. Spider-Man 2 is where you had sandbox combat, like the stair step kicks, hanging enemies from street posts. And Spider-Man 2 is where you got the crazy pizza delivery missions. I mean, it's kind of just unique to its own, right? But point being, Spider-Man 2 is that dude. It is the game of which all these different Spider-Man games were built upon and continue to borrow from. But it was also just transformative for the industry. So many games would try to go open world and do what Spider-Man 2 did, a tie-in movie game, but just failed to replicate time in and time out. Now this would also set it up for a lot of, hey, we should run that back moments in the Spider-Man franchise that I will indicate. But more than anything, Spider-Man 2 is a symbol of what Spider-Man games could always be. No longer were we technically limited. We had to create smog to engulf the city. You can web swing from one end to the other. It may not look as pretty as Spider-Man 1, but you could do it now. And that was awesome stuff. Meanwhile, if you were like me and you love Spider-Man 1 so much and you want more of that, that linear energy, Spider-Man 2 on PSP is a great time. If you want the reused assets from the PNGs for character portraits all the way down to the sound bites, you're going to get that in Spider-Man 2 on PSP, making it one of the few worthwhile double dips in our industry where you get two completely different experiences on different systems. So yeah, Spider-Man 2 is a game that I spent countless hours with running through random crime after random crime after random crime. Today, if you fire up Spider-Man 2, I'm gonna keep it real. It's kind of unimpressive. Oh no, my balloon. You do that a million and one times. Or, hey Spidey, what's going on over there? And all of a sudden a massive tank spawns and you gotta dodge a million gunshots at you. I mean, the game gets ridiculous fast. And there are times the combat doesn't feel great, but there is no denying this is the blueprint. Spider-Man 2 is a transformative video game and I will always stand by that. Which, of course, leads to nonsense like this. Okay, so Spider-Man 3, it's in the oven right now. Let him cook. One year later, you get what is the evergreen Spider-Man game, I always call it, Ultimate Spider-Man. And what a fitting time to talk about it, right? We lined up this one in Web of Shadows. We talked about them recently to set us up for the symbiote-focused story of Spider-Man 2 from Insomniac. And that's just what Ultimate Spider-Man is. But it was unlike anything we had seen in a comic book video game at that time. The art style was, as you would imagine, much more comic book inspired. The story involved you not only playing as the hero, but the villain. And it captured the brutality of Venom beautifully, as you would literally pick up enemies and snap their spines in half. You got to eat people, even the first person you eat as Venom, it's a child. I mean, this game got dark 
And as a kid growing up, loving these heroes, you never got to see this perspective ever. And still to this day, you really don't. It's rare, for example, you get a movie like Joker. You just don't get villain origin stories. You don't get villain focused games anymore because the natural thought of a creative is, how do we make you feel good? How do we make you be the hero? I don't wanna make you too sad. I wanna make you feel good. And you wanna see a hero's coming of age tale, right? Ultimate Spider-Man challenged that very idea, that very concept, and put you in the suit or the body or the whatever the hell he is of Venom and let you wreak havoc on New York City. But Ultimate Spider-Man is just the perfect candidate for a remaster. Look at this art style, feast your eyes on it, and enjoy. It is absolutely beautiful. Now, it wasn't just the villain concept that made this game a real challenge to the norm. It was also that it was willing to pull in other characters from the Marvel Universe. So you'd see Wolverine, you'd see the Human Torch. This was exceedingly rare because they were not a part of the Spider-Verse, if you will. And as someone who grew up on a ton of X-Men games, when I saw Wolverine as one of the first boss fights, I lost my dang mind as a kid. I couldn't believe it, but it was even more unbelievable because he wasn't my friend. I was fighting this dude tooth and nail and I beat him to a pulp. That was crazy, but perhaps what's even crazier is the combat almost has this free flow feel to it. It can almost play itself a little too much as it's really about wall bouncing as Spider-Man and you'll go all over the place. They removed the dodge mechanic that was in Spider-Man 2, which I just don't get why, because that's the one missing mechanic that I think would fortify what is an excellent combat system here because you have just no answer on protecting yourself you just have to be nimble and get all over the place which i guess kind of makes sense he plays a teenager still going to high school so this is a very young spider-man so i get that he's not supposed to kick too much ass but i don't think a little dodge mechanic would have hurt so it's that exquisite art style coupled with wonderful cutscene delivery which replicated that of spider-man 64 where it was very comic book focused there were like comic book strips layering upon each other where you'd have a close-up in one panel and then a distant shot in another it's like you were just playing a comic book i, I just cannot get over how inventive this game was how much it pushed the boundaries forward even when the gameplay could get a little tedious because given the production quality here and how high it was you could tell they had only a limited amount of time for a story and so they padded it out by making you do city goals you'd web swing around beat up thugs do all manner of things and you'd unlock a story mission and finally get to play a little bit more but that meant that you'd have to do the odd race here and there and eventually that just loses its luster and you fall a bit out of love with the game there but when you get into that story you get into the heat of that presentation oh man what a special time it is and the amount of hours i spent just running around as venom as a kid oh the memories spider-man 3 home to some of the greatest memes and also retro rebounds most popular video point being this game is wild because remember what I was talking about with Spider-Man 2 where you had this almost dual purchase approach where you'd get two completely different experiences for a game on different systems? Spider-Man 3 is that if you have it on the Xbox 360 or the PS2. On the Xbox 360, you get access to 10 different storylines across an open world, featuring the likes of Venom, New Goblin, Sandman, some of the most ridiculous voice acting ever, and some of the most aggressive. Like, when you hear Tobey Maguire throwing some haymakers in this game, oh, he hates whoever he's hitting. <laughs> Meanwhile, on PS2, there's five storylines, which I put this in quotes, includes bonus villains like Morbius and Shriek. So you get some weird inclusions there that you wouldn't get on either version, which kind of makes it for the hardcore fan worth playing both. But normally you see these limitations leading to different creative choices. But Spider-Man 3 on PS2 was designed way differently than Spider-Man 3 on Xbox 360. Let me break it down for you. So for example, the suit unlock time is different in both games. Whereas in the 360 version, you get it very late, but in the PS2 version, it hands it to you super quickly. Now the PS2 version, the way the suit works is it actually limits your usage of the black suit by kind of draining your health. Meanwhile, on Xbox 360, things like web swinging feel pretty amazing because there's a ton of horizontal momentum rather than games like we'll talk about with Amazing Spider-Man where a lot of the momentum goes up like this when you're always releasing like this, you go up into the sky, you free fall, and it looks good. 
But when it comes to actual web swinging and going from point A to point B, it's about when you release how Spider-Man carries himself forward. Something that Insomniac nailed beautifully. But Spider-Man 3 on Xbox 360 has that down. Meanwhile, on PS2, it's very much the same building blocks that you saw in Spider-Man 2 lightly evolved upon. So it feels worse over there to get around. But there are more dramatic design differences. Like, for example, the 360 version, when you complete a mission, it automatically upgrades things for you. Like, congrats, you just unlocked a six hit combo by hitting X six times. Meanwhile, PS2 is much like Spider-Man 2, where in Spider-Man 2, you'll beat up enemies, you'll collect experience points, and you can go to an upgrade shop and get all new moves there. You can do that in the PS2 version of Spider-Man 3. So it actually is one of those games from back then where you look at it and go, which one is your favorite version? And I don't really have a good answer for that because I'm kind of mixed on it. There are things about Spider-Man 2 I really like on a gameplay level, but Spider-Man 3, I mean, I can't deny the web swinging feels incredible still to this day. You also, in both versions, get some of the most hilarious quick time events where the one if you fail to swing in and save a woman, um, she blows up. So yeah, the game's ridiculous. The combat is very all over the place, whereas Spider-Man 2, it was very dodge dependent, where sometimes you couldn't even attack because you were dodging so much. Whereas Spider-Man 3 kind of reaches for more of that fluidity where it's pretty much telling you hammer away. And if you see an exclamation point above someone's head, you hold LB, the game will auto dodge for you. And you'll see a little button prompt above the enemy's head. You press that likely the attack button and you'll knock them away. And you can go focus on the next enemy. It actually is technically an upgrade to what you got in Spider-Man 2. And when you look at what you had in Ultimate Spider-Man, Spider-Man 3 really is the hybrid of these two systems put together. And so as much as I was kind of sour on it at first, when I was playing around with it again this time for this video, I was thinking, you know what? This isn't that bad. It isn't as all over the place. It's definitely messy, but it's not as awful as I had once interpreted it as. But yeah, Spider-Man 3 is a crazy video game with that Spider-Man 3 meme quality. Of course, you get the black suit, but differences in design make both versions kind of worth owning and playing at some point in time. Both games are incredibly short, so you can burst through them both in a single weekend if you'd even like to. But yeah, Spider-Man 3, while it's no Spider-Man 2 and reinventing the wheel, I don't know how they could have followed up to it in a really successful way. I think it does enough. Yep, that'll do it. Yeah! So we got one more in the official Spider-Man movie merchandise line of video games, and you're probably peering over my shoulder right now going, wait, that is not friend or foe. What? That's Web of Shadows. Consider that a little teaser of what's to come, and also my uh, disc isn't loading, so I, I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, let's talk about Spider-Man friend or foe. This is one of the rare skips for Matty originally, but then he got back around to it. So Spider-Man friend or foe is more of a fixed camera, action beat em up game definitely felt like at least on a content level and an offering level from all the open world stuff you got a step down and also with its art style shifting more to a kid friendly look it didn't really speak to me and many others off the rip so i was very closed off to it i remember picking it up one time as i think one of my last blockbuster rentals i played it for a bit over the weekend and just wasn't feeling it after a couple of hours and put it down. Picking it back up, it definitely is a standout among the other Spider-Man games here. Not really for quality, but it's definitely different. And it did some admittedly bold things that I don't think I could have properly appreciated at the time. For example, your starting sidekick in this co-op beat-em-up game is Prowler. Now I know Prowler is all the rage now because of the likes of Miles Morales, his story, how those two have been woven together thanks to the Into the Spider-Verse movies and whatnot. I understand Prowler is a much more familiar sidekick nowadays, but back then, to make the starting sidekick, not even Black Cat, not obvious choices at the time with Spider-Man 3 coming out like Venom, Sandman, Green Goblin maybe, Doc Ock, Prowler. Bold move, and I respect it completely. So yeah, as the title would suggest, friend or foe. Who's your friend, who's the foe? Everyone's your friend in Spider-Man, friend or foe. So yeah, you get to team up with everybody. And it's 
awesome stuff here. So you'll do co-op moves with Doc Ock or Sandman. I mean, it's some really awesome stuff here. Now, at first, this is definitely your, we have ultimate alliance at home, sweetie, okay? You don't need friend or foe right now, but can't lie. The combat starts cooking as you get into the upgrade tree. So you can go to this upgrade lab and the shield base and you can get all sorts of tricks for Spider-Man, like being able to slam medium-sized enemies and create an impact wave or throw enemies and be able to create a gas bomb with that. So eventually you get all of these little additions to moves you already have off the rip and it leads to little creative combos that you can make. Like you can grab someone, throw them down onto the ground in the air, beat them up for an air combo. Your friend can jump in, air combo them, throw them, and you can hop in. It makes for some pretty satisfying fighting that reminds me a bit of Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks in a way where you can just keep the combo string going if you really want to. It's simplistic, it's approachable, it's definitely kid-friendly, but that doesn't mean that it's not good i do like it i can't lie the levels can go on a bit too long which is what always happens like if these stages i know it would mean a much shorter game which means less value for your dollar but i think it would make it for a better game like some of these missions just go on way too long and you want to get to the upgrade station get your next set of boosts whether it be strength health defense or they call it toughness or special moves per sidekick or the upgrades i mentioned for spider-man's moves like you want to get to that stuff but the game holds you in missions for so long, it can definitely tear down the experience a little bit. But Spider-Man Friend or Foe is one of the more strange Spider-Man games. It's not gonna be your favorite, but a hidden gem, I think that would be fair. Okay, let's just go ahead and uh, do this. And uh, yeah, let's talk about Web of Shadows. This is definitely the most entertaining Spider-Man story available, as I mentioned in our solo discussion on this game. You can make some of the most out-of-pocket choices here. At first, it starts off like, okay, what do I want to do with these gangs? Like, these aren't do-gooders. But then your loyalty is going to get tested. Then your thirst for blood is going to get tested. I mean, you get some real, like, it goes from A to Z, 0 to 100 real quick. Is it the best told Spider-Man story? No, but is it hilarious? 100%. Can you shove Black Cat off a building and then not save her? Absolutely. This game is wild, as is the combat, because you can switch between suits whenever you want, whether it be your red suit or your black suit. And you can do this, like I said, mid-combo, going from kick-flipping a dude's face into the ground all the way to aerial zip attacks. Spider-Man in his regular costume is much better at the aerial combos, whereas Spider-Man in his symbiote suit is more about the ground and pound, viciousness. So you can really mix and match here. And not only that, but it goes back to the essence of Ultimate Spider-Man, where you got heroes and villains from all walks of life making their way into the web of shadows. Of course, you get villains like Venom, but then you get Wolverine showing up, who's on the cover of the game, by the way. Awesome. Black Cat, naturally. I just think that the amount of heroes and villains that show up in this game are awesome, and it's even better because you get choices on how you interact with them. And it stuns me that there isn't a Spider-Man game trying this nowadays. Like, yeah, it was Web of Shadows perfect to some, yes, to me, no, but... That's kind of what makes it special, but there is at the heart of it, a really good idea of, hey, Spider-Man has always had this evil side to him. And as a hero, the choice of the greater good has never been difficult. Why aren't there more superhero games about choices? Why is it always a big cinematic adventure, which I'm not against, but this game had a really good idea and truly explored it. And that's why I appreciate Web of Shadows so much. Even if um, the voice acting is, <laughs> Um, not, not the, it's bad. It's, it's really bad. It's worse than Spider-Man 3. It's really bad. I promise you this whole city is yours. Really? Yep. And I know just who to take it from. Mmm, big guy wearing a cravat. That's right. It's time to talk about one of my all-time favorite Spider-Man games, Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. You don't get to play as just one Spider-Man, and the big thing about Spider-Man 2 is you get to play as two Spider-Man, which we've kind of seen in a sense before, if you count two different suits in Spider-Man 3, or Ultimate Spider-Man, where you play Spider-Man and Venom, but this game says, ha, 
We're gonna one up all y'all around here for Spider-Man. Put this one on the list with Ultimate Spider-Man to be a remaster candidate and Xbox now owning Activision Blizzard. My God, if you can do anything with Marvel, talk to them, get this game back. It is so good because not only does it remind me of that linear style spider-man game and show that there is potential there but the amount of different play styles here i'm not going to oversell it to you but it really is one of my favorite takes on the spider-man universe and this was done before the multiverse was popular before the crossovers were popular before messing with superhero timelines was popular this game did it first and that's why it'll always hold a special place in my heart. But much like I said with Ultimate Spider-Man, this comic book art style is absolutely evergreen. You could play this game now, 10 years from now, another 10 years from now, it still, in my eyes, looks great. Could it use a little bit of sharpening up on modern tech? Absolutely, to get the clearest image possible, but this art style is a thing of beauty. And it's also because they play with the art style creatively, whether it be through the black and white filter that's seen in Spider-Man Noir, or the very highly saturated futuristic appearance of Spider-Man 2099. You could play as all different Spider-Man and these universes feel different, not just because of the play style, but the visuals too. Because beyond Spider-Man Noir and 2099, you also have regular Spider-Man, and then you also have Ultimate Spider-Man. So you just have the pick of the litter here, and each of them play a little bit different. Now, Noir plays the most unique because he's weaker in combat in select areas. There are points in his playthrough that you're gonna let the fisticuffs go flying, and he'll hold his own perfectly fine. But if you're in a dedicated stealth segment and he gets caught, he's not good at defending himself. So it's a little topsy-turvy there, but overall, this is a stealth focus where if you're in the light, it's kind of like the saboteur where color returns, but that's what happens when you stand under a lamppost. Meanwhile, regular Spider-Man plays as you would expect, pretty beat -em up style gameplay, except he uses more web combos, where Ultimate Spider-Man is more devastating in 2099, is able to slow down time and use these reflexes to dodge and get around their foes. So really it's Noir and 2099 who separate themselves the most, that's okay with me that those are the two more distinct play styles, whereas the other two are more familiar grounds because I think that's what offsets them. If all of them are trying to do way too different of things, there is that potential of going, I really just have a pure favorite here. But what I love about Shattered Dimensions in my experience with the game playing through it multiple times is I don't really have a clear favorite. Each level is based around a boss, and so it has its own theme. You'll have a Deadpool mission with Ultimate Spider-Man, or you'll have an Electro mission with Ultimate Spider-Man. You'll have a mission focused on Kraven the Hunter as regular Spider-Man. It's just so many different styles and takes, and so this takes that grand comic book video game idea and pushes it further than I think any other game on this list, truly, including Spider-Man 2018. This one is just the rogues gallery, the art style, and then it reminds me a bit of the linearity of those older Spider-Man games, like 64, like the first Raimi game, where it shows to me that there's still potential in this idea. If you were to ask me, I would humbly agree. It has weird first-person cutscenes too, so there's a little strange flavor there. You even have a massive upgrade tree that's shared among all these different Spider-Men in the terms of points. So as you beat up enemies and loot the environment, you're gonna get points that are shared across all Spider-Men, and then you can spend it on upgrades for them. There's just so much to do with this game, so much replayability. It's one of my favorite ones to go back to. It's there's a reason why, if you include this video, we've we've triple dipped on Shattered Dimensions. And now I see why. What I don't go back to three times plus is Edge of Time, which as you'll see in a moment here, has the most going hard title screen I've ever seen in a Spider-Man game still to this day. When you see it open up with 2099 carrying the lifeless body of Spider-Man dead at the hands of Anti-Venom, it hits hard. It's like, okay, we're going here. You already know the end result of this timeline is that Spider-Man gets brutally murdered. And it's a wonderful setup for a plot alongside this very unique cutscene delivery where you're gonna transition between Spider-Man 2099 and regular Spider-Man to create 
very interesting set pieces whereas you do things in one world it's going to impact the other now part of that story setup is that the head of alchemax one of these big companies in the spider-verse is going back in time to rebuild their company from the ground up way before it was originally conceived thus giving it a ton of control in this world and changing the timeline entirely so that's where these two spider-men link together the, the alive one and the dead one he, he comes back to life don't worry about it but they link together and they have to work together even though they're at odds with one another to fix the timeline effectively so it is another timeline story and because of shattered dimensions edge of time out the gate wasn't received super well you're going from four spider-men to two what and there's a lot of people who don't get it twisted love edge of time my comment section on any time i've talked about edge of time shows that much to me but if you were to ask me personally uh, -uh this game is not good those opening moments are fantastic and there is a sprinkle of brilliance here and there but otherwise i just think edge of time is missed potential and when you're releasing the same year as arkham city skyrim's around the corner i mean it was just not a competitive product at the time and the fact that even away from all that zeitgeist i still don't view it highly it's just not a great spider-man game but let's break it down a little bit more beyond less spider-man it also looks like a complete downgrade where every room is one of four styles effectively you're gonna see a similar hallway you're gonna see a similar lab a similar room full of generators or somehow we have a sewage kind of area in the game it just is cycling these same assets constantly and i know it makes sense at the end of the day it's all in this big alchemax tower as you're climbing to the top and it's this race to the finish it feels more like a glorified expansion to edge of time rather than i would personally say an actual true successor which evolved the ideas in meaningful ways because it's not just a downgrade in visuals because i don't like this art style it just looks worse but it's also the gameplay is arguably more simplified than what it was in Shattered Dimensions. You could forgive that Ultimate Spider-Man wasn't as deep or Spider-Man felt a little similar to Ultimate Spider-Man because there were four to balance. You could only expect so much in a brand new entry before they built upon it. Edge of Time felt like, okay, we're gonna get rid of the fat here, Ultimate Spider-Man can go, and we'll get rid of Noir as well. Okay, we're gonna add a ton more here, right? But it was less and it was made in a very short span of time which is why i am slightly forgiving of what edge of time brings to the table but it just doesn't capitalize on things enough to have it be a meaningful follow-up to shattered dimensions and this will be a problem with Beanox, the developer of not only shattered dimensions but also this game and amazing spider-man 1 and 2 where they start off with a good game in a series and then the follow-up just doesn't hit the mark wakey wakey spider-man so after Edge of Time, which released, as I said, next to Arkham City and Skyrim, a lot of the Spider-Man fandom was going, all right, it's time for Spider-Man to have its Arkham moment. As Arkham elevated what superhero games were to a whole other stratosphere, Spider-Man doing these artsy, fartsy kind of games like Shattered Dimensions and lesser well-received products like Edge of Time led to a real outcry from the fandom. And the answer was the tie-in video game movie, Amazing Spider-Man 1 from Beanox in their third go around as Spider-Man developers. Look, with Amazing Spider-Man 1, this was about the closest we ever got to that insomniac form before they actually stepped in. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but Amazing Spider-Man 1 does to Spider-Man 2 what Spider-Man 1 did to Spider-Man 64, if you're following my drift here. It takes all of the core elements and expands upon them in meaningful ways. Sure, the car chases and random crimes are back, but now you can beat up thugs in a more momentum-based, free-flow style combat system. Did it feel as good as what you got in an Arkham game? No, but it was almost there. It was close enough where it was enjoyable as we were getting a lot of Arkham clones. You were getting like Captain America trying to do an Arkham clone style combat system. No game flowed quite like what Rocksteady had produced, but this was, in my opinion, the closest you got. Granted, you could throw in Shadow of Mordor into that part of the conversation as the closest, but that was a WB published game that used the tech from one game and 
brought into the other. Yes, there are missions that you have to do in the open world, just like you would find in Spider-Man 2, but they feature some of the largest scale boss fights we've ever seen in a Spider-Man game yet. Like this opening mech boss you get to fight in New York City as it's just destroying things around you. The camera's working perfectly. This game feels great to play overall. Yes, it's more of a time capsule feels great to play because if you were to size this up versus Insomniac Spider-Man, it's an inferior version of that. But for the time, I was addicted to this game. I got all the achievements. Like I loved Amazing Spider-Man because it did what those great Raimi Spider-Man games did, particularly Spider-Man 2, which it threaded the movie plot, as I've said before, stop me if I'm a broken record here, into this more rogues gallery style story. And it was just a ton of fun to run through, especially because the combat felt good, but it also was like, okay, the sky's the limit. Like we're this close to our Arkham style Spider-Man game. Like it's Batman and Spider-Man. These two are at the top of the list for most loved superheroes. Spider-Man should be able to figure something out here, but this is just the framework. They're not gonna pull Rocksteady off the rip with Asylum. They're gonna cook a little bit and come around Amazing Spider-Man 2. We're gonna get that Arkham style Spider-Man game. We didn't. I will make you what you were meant to be, the ultimate hunter. Man. I, you know, it's like in Amazing Spider-Man 1, Beanox was a bunch of five-star chefs in a kitchen together, really just cooking something up. The food was marinating. They put it in the oven. And then this game comes around. It's like you pull it out of the oven. It's burnt. It's way too crispy. It smells bad. You're like, what? Who, bro, who let bro cook? That's what I got to ask. What happened with Amazing Spider-Man 2? At every game on this list, I don't know if I've been really negative outside of Edge of Time. This is the worst game on the list. Amazing Spider-Man 2 was such a colossal letdown for Spider-Man fans like myself. The hype before this game was unreal if you were a Spider-Man fan for one reason, Carnage. I have been begging for Carnage to come back into a Spider-Man game since 64, where this dude scared the life out of me as a kid. And I thought, man, with modern tech, with more mature Spider-Man storytelling, we could do something pretty special here with Carnage in Amazing Spider-Man 2. It felt like it was stepping even further away from the movie to tell its own individual story. It was really exciting. Oh my God, how foolish was I? Oh my God, did they miss the ball? Let's get into it. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna make another comparison here to all of the Spider-Man games in this list. So much like Edge of Time was to Shattered Dimensions, this sequel to Amazing Spider-Man 1 was a downgrade in every conceivable way. The natural weaving of the rogues gallery story from the first game was done sloppily as you have to have villains like Carnage randomly killing a gang member that you're in hot pursuit of because they took out Uncle Ben, uh, but they did this in broad daylight. And so somehow Carnage had time to decorate a crime scene even though you were there right on his tail the entire time. The game just way too often asks you to suspend your disbelief. And even if you don't care about that stuff, Maddie, you're being hypercritical. The new mechanics added to this game are the worst to ever be put in a Spider-Man game. The hero and menace system, I, outside of my first go around with my friends in Dragon Ball Fighters, don't think I've ever raged at a game more in my life because of how infuriatingly bad and blatantly untested this system was. By the midpoint of the game, you have Everyone, no matter how many side activities you did, how many people you helped out as the hero, right? You still become a menace to society and they do not stop shooting at you until you beat the game. It is horrible. I can't imagine what the thought process was when they said, let's make a Spider-Man game that has point A to point B traversal be awful. You take out all of the best parts of a Spider-Man game and you're left with half-baked combat that didn't get any sort of addition so now it's starting to really feel like this is this is mid now we're we're heading into arkham knight territory and this is what you're giving us the stealth gameplay was never enhanced one of the big complaints with amazing spider-man was hey this is good but like we need the camera to get better something that has plagued the spider-man games for so so long they still didn't get right here and all the little incremental upgrades that they could have done this was something that was just overlooked there are also other very strange additions like a new conversation system where you can pick your own dialogue options and at first you're thinking oh cool but you quickly realize this is just 
like a way to avoid a traditional cutscene without putting the extra work in to deliver said cutscene. And look, I get it. Beanox was on their fourth Spider-Man game in a row. Look, as a game developer, if I could work on four Spider-Man games in a row, I would not be complaining. And I never saw any public complaints from them. But as a player, as a fan, I felt like this was an uninspired product and that they were ready to move on. And this was the last Spider-Man game they ever worked on. And this was one of the last Marvel games, if not the last one, to come out of that deal that they had with Activision, who was publishing all of these Spider-Man games we've been talking about this entire time. That's how far back it goes from 64 all the way to now. Every single one of these has been published by Activision. Crazy to think about, right? So this marks the end of a pretty historic run as Disney, Lucasfilm, they're looking around like, who are we gonna dish this IP to? And they picked the perfect developer. All right, got your Spider-Man 2 controller ready? Good, it's time to go to the greatest of all time Spider-Man game. Spider-Man PS4, we ain't talking about PS5 because that remastered face, I know some people call us weird for still being upset about it, that face does not work. That is not my Spider-Man, eh, cut it, nope, 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 nope. Anyway, on to more pressing matters. Spider-Man PS4, why is it so great? Well, I'm gonna run down a list of things you probably heard before, but I gotta get it off my chest, okay? It starts off with the duality of Spider-Man and how the man who dons the costume has a tremendous impact on those around him. And that's never been captured better, in my opinion, than this game right here. Whether it be Peter's relationship with Doc Ock, which I thought was incredible and a beautiful homage to Spider-Man 2. Even knowing this man was undoubtedly set for a heel turn. You know when you watch wrestling and you're like, that dude's gonna super kick someone in a minute here and I, it's gonna happen. Just give me a couple episodes, it's gonna happen. That's what you felt about Doc Ock, but the fact that they managed to make me care and even cheer from a bit, that's, that's spectacular stuff right there. They also brought to the forefront a villain character that I was not super aware of at all in Mr. Negative, Martin Lee, who I just gotta say, had some really compelling motivations to be a villain, not just, ha ha ha, I want power and money, what, don't you? And this is because the duality of Spider-Man is the heart of it all. You get to know Martin Lee, the person, not just Mr. Negative, the villain, because you as Peter Parker are going to meet up with him a lot. And there's those tense encounters of, I know you, and you kind of have an idea of who I am. And so we're playing mental chess right now. This is going to be off topic, but I don't care. That reminds me a lot of Death Note, and that's my stuff, man. I love when the hero and the villain, if you will, are just interacting constantly. It's what produces the best material on screen always. It never fails, and this game is a prime example of that. And it goes into more wholesome areas, that duality approach of Peter Parker and, of course, Aunt May. And especially when you get to the end of the game. I'm not even talking about... The tearjerker, the heartbreaker. I'm talking about that last line that she shares with Peter and how she always knew. That just, man, so good. So yeah, it's the duality. It's capturing not just the wisecracker who's in the suit. It's about the human Peter Parker. That is absolutely the heartbeat of this story. But when it comes to just being Spider-Man, oh, does this game just nail it? Oh my God. The free flow combat. This was the Arkham experience that we had been asking for. And as someone who is a huge Spider-Man fan, everything I had put on a wish list, like, man, imagine if you could use your web to pull yourself to an enemy or pull them to you or pull them to you in the air or uppercut them. Oh, this game had it all. And then I thought to myself, it was when I was watching Amazing Spider-Man 2 in the theaters, I went, why don't more Spider-Man games just lean into the gadgetry side of things. Like this dude's a scientist, this dude's a genius. Why don't we have more of that capture in a game? Insomniac knew, they knew the mission right away. and They had an answer for me. So you're throwing all sorts of gadgets out there, which is kind of fitting for what the Arkham style combat is, right? Where you had the, the blast gel, for example, that you could have multi-purpose use for. In Spider-Man PS4, that's the one thing that's missing. There isn't that multi-purpose usage that I think is missing here. If I had one critique of Spider-Man PS4, it's that the open world is a little too one, two, three. 
This is why I just think Arkham City is the best open world superhero game made because the Riddler trophies, the Metroidvania-like nature in this game, it's a far more impressive design than, hey, we put a bunch of antennas here, you're gonna hit three of them, and then you're gonna collect a million and one backpacks and beat up a few gangs and chase down a few cars. This is the one part I don't feel they evolved enough but I'm willing to overlook it because everything else they got right. The story kicks butt. It blew me away. The combat is more incredible than I could have expected. They got the gadgetry right. And I think they got the little quirks right too, although a lot of people are against it. Like many people don't enjoy the Mary Jane gameplay of Spider-Man PS4. I love it because it feels like she's actually a useful character. It feels like she's not just Peter Parker's love interest. She has a mission. She has a purpose here too. And it's not just shoehorned in. Many people always claim like, oh man, this killed the pacing. This brought it to a halt. Stop. Just gamers need an ounce of patience to see something else other than swinging around and beating the life out of thugs. Like there is more to the Spider-Verse. And I like that Insomniac not only dared to do it, but in the sequel where they got a lot of feedback saying, nah, that wasn't it, doubled down and actually gave MJ a stun gun. I mean, that stuff is so legit, man. So I like that they added these stealth segments. And speaking of, they got the camera right in this game too when you are stealthing down enemies. Just beautiful work across the board here. I cannot emphasize how much I love this game. It was one of the most enjoyable platinum trophies I could go for. Oh my God, 20 plus million copies, well-deserved. And then, there was one more Spider-Man game, Spider-Man Miles Morales. It's New York City again, but it's snowing this time. Woo, snow's like one of my favorite weather patterns. So, you know, pardon me if I'm a little extra amped for that. By the way, this, this title screen is awesome, especially because of the little hip hop tune they got going here. Mm, that's where I want to kick it off. One thing I love about Miles Morales is I think it's all about the culture here. The representation packed into Miles Morales is something I've seen so many folks say that it reminds them of home, of family, the way Miles' apartment is decorated to the voice direction. Insomniac showed that not only was Spider-Man PS4 not some sort of one-off, but that they understand the Spider-Verse more importantly. And yes, it's going to have your same tried and true Spider-Man gameplay here, but since it's more of an origin story, a coming of age tale of how did Miles Morales go from, I'm new to this and I'm watching over New York City while Peter Parker is gone to the end of the story where, hey dude, take your time, I've got this. I have to say I wasn't as in love with Miles Morales as a story compared to Spider-Man PS4, but I think that's only natural because Miles Morales is this, quick five to six hour story where there's not enough time to grow an emotional attachment and see characters build. They do great with the screen time they have, but it's just not enough where Spider-Man PS4 had plenty of time to let these characters establish themselves, reveal their motivations, make shocking changes, have big moments pay off. Miles Morales does have an emotional payoff at the end and it's, oh my God, that final cutscene is so good. But Miles Morales, I just don't think has enough time to land a very impactful story, but it's about establishing him as a hero and the game does succeed on that. It also has some of the most fun Spider-Man suits I think are available in a Spider-Man game. For example, they have a Spider-Verse style suit that harkens back to the movie and even changes the frame count on the suit. So as you're using it, when you're web swinging, when you're fighting, the frame rate for the character model is different from everything else around you. These suits were plentiful in Spider-Man PS4, but I like that this one was gimmicky on a visual level. But I have to admit, it was the first Spider-Man game since Edge of Time that I went, I'll get to that a little bit later. Just because it looked like, and I'm gonna be brutally honest here, glorified DLC. And in a way, it was sort of a, let's run it back, let's use the same city, let's not evolve those open world things that Maddie was kind of critical of. But Miles Morales does play differently. And the hope and excitement that drove me while playing was, man, imagine if Spider-Man and Miles get together in a game and now we have Spider-Man 2. So ladies and gentlemen, that's your full retrospective on every Spider-Man game since the year 2000. Thank you so much for tuning in. As you all know, Spider-Man is very important to me, so I cannot wait to play Spider-Man 2. I'm sure you're all in the same boat. 
So fire away. Let me know what you're thinking about all these Spider-Man games. Which one is your favorite? And with that, take excellent care of yourselves and I will see you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace.